You're watching Captains of Industry here on CNBC Africa, and I'm chatting to Andre de Reuter, who is the CEO of NAMPAC. Andre, thanks for your time. Yeah. I want to take you back to your Sassel days and ask you why you didn't stay on. You were one of the top executives in the Sassel fold, many saying you could have gone for the top job. Look, I had a really wonderful career at Sassel. Uh, many opportunities, uh, a lot of exposure to different industries. Uh, but it became clear to me that from a personal perspective, I wanted to try something different. I wanted to row my own boat, as it were. And when the call came from NAMPAC, it sounded like a, like a really good idea. It was a company that I had a lot of uh, respect for. Uh, obviously, being a customer of Sassel's, I, I knew about NAMPAC. Um, and therefore decided to give it a go. And uh, of course, I anticipated the drop in the oil price. Exactly. You anticipated the drop in the oil price, so you got out at exactly the right time. Exactly. Because the, the oil price is impacting a number of the regions yes. that you operate in, and it's yes. going to make up a substantial part of the conversation that we're going to have. Let's go to April 2014. You take over as CEO mm -hmm. of NAMPAC, and the share price is in a, a difficult period. Yes. And it hasn't recovered. Yes. So right now, you are walking the hard yards. A company has to be sustainably profitable. And I think one needs to spend a lot of attention not only focusing on the lower end of the income statement, not only looking at the release of provisions, once-off benefits, you need to look at, in our case, making bottles and cans profitable. Now that takes time to translate through to the bottom line. You need to look at your cost base, you need to look at operations excellence, you need to recapitalize some tired and old equipment that we in a number of instances had across NAMPAC, uh, kit up to 40 years old that we had to replace with. And the conversion of your cans from correct. tin through to aluminium. Correct, correct. So there's been a major turnaround uh, on the go uh, since I took over. Focus on the basics of the business uh, has been important, it's been necessary, but it takes time to flow through to the bottom line. Uh, macroeconomics haven't helped. And let, let's dwell on the macroeconomics because Africa is a big part of mm -hmm. NAMPAC's story. And uh, let's talk about Nigeria and Angola specifically that have been yes. hard hit by the oil price. The headlines recently being dominated by an oil price. We're not sure where sustainably the oil price is going, but right now it has had a hard, hard knock mm -hmm. on both Nigeria and Angola. Does that dampen the outlook for NAMPAC in those territories? At the end of the 2015 financial year, we did report some forex losses as a result of currency that we were unable to repatriate from those two countries due to a lack of liquidity. At the year end, we had approximately 700 million rand in those two countries. And obviously that gives us a degree of exposure to further devaluations in the two currencies, Kwanzaa and Naira, respectively. It's not all doom and gloom. We have been able to obtain, particularly in Nigeria, I have to say, uh, access to hard currency to pay for the imports of raw materials. So the foreign exchange crisis is not as bad as people are making it out to be? Would you go as far as to say that? I think so. I think what, what, what people are doing is pricing in uh, the absolute worst case scenario, but they don't take account of the fact that we have been able to, for example, in the case of Nigeria, pay for imports of raw materials using hard currency that we are able to obtain in the local market. What is your market share in Nigeria? We operate three businesses. So we have a cartons business, we have a general purpose can business, and then we have the beverage can business. So we are ramping up quite quickly to about a half market share, 50% market share in the beverage can business. We've got about a 40% market share in the general purpose can business and then a 60-70% market share in the cartons business. So we're well positioned in that country to serve the market. And regulatory policy in Angola must be working in your favor as well. They are wanting to support, as you've indicated in Nigeria, they're wanting to support the local manufacturing industry Correct. and in fact limit imports which would compete directly Correct. with you. There are import barriers in place which work to our favor obviously. Uh, and then in Angola, there is a substantial import duty. And now that we have invested in capacity in Angola to supply the needs of the entire market, we are obviously able to persuade the government to 
impose that duty, not that it's necessary because we have recently announced that we've reached agreement with the last remaining customer in that country. I've just come back from the World Economic Forum in Davos and had the opportunity to interview the Vice President of Nigeria, mm. Osin Bajo. And I did ask him the question outright about security and how that is impacting foreign direct investment, particularly as Boko Haram is seen as the number one terror group uh, globally. Has that yes. impacted your business to, to any extent? It's more of a market demand impact uh, and it's modest. It's, it's, it's one of many factors and it's not nearly top of the list. So I think one, one has to be um, careful to tar the whole of Nigeria with the Boko Haram brush. It's not top of my concerns. Before we move off Nigeria and Angola, you obviously are there for the long term and you see unprecedented opportunity or am I putting words in your mouth? We think that the demographic uh, dynamics of Africa are very much intact. Um, if you listen to what Sim Chabalala said the other day about why he still remains confident about the African opportunity, we, we absolutely concur with that. Um, so we, we're also Afro-optimists. Now we recognize that that is a contrarian position to have at this point in time. But if you look at the underlying trends, if you look at the youth bulge, if you look at people making the transition from a subsistence level of existence, which is really pretty grim and dire, and making the transition into a position where they, for the first time, buy FMCG goods, uh, that opportunity remains intact and we, and we remain convinced that the short-term issues aside, Africa is still the place to be. Talk to me about automation and how that is impacting your business from a manufacturing perspective because your support into Africa will be largely because you are able to employ people in the local environment. Correct. The minute that you see automation threatening that ability to employ local people, then you may have some pushback. Are you, how automated are your factories? We have, uh, over the years, shed, like many other manufacturers, a substantial number of jobs. And I think if you look at the bigger macro picture for manufacturing in South Africa, as a percentage of GDP, it's gone down from just under 30% to less than 13%. And in the process, manufacturing in South Africa has lost about half a million jobs, which, as South Africa, we can ill afford. That's on the one hand. On the other hand, however, we cannot afford to be stuck in a sweatshop era where you use labour-intensive manufacturing practices. We have to be globally competitive. We have to use the latest generation technology and apply that. And that is what we want to do. Uh, so we are going to become less labour-intensive as a percentage of units that we manufacture. But as we grow together with the economy, obviously we will employ more people. Ethiopia is a big growth story at the moment. Uh, we've seen a decade of double-digit growth. The government is certainly deregulating and supporting private sector investment through their second growth and transformation plan. I've read articles that allude to a bottling plant in Ethiopia. Talk to me about that opportunity. And again, notwithstanding the, the broader context that we do have a softer commodity environment, we've got a drought in that territory which is impacting the overall mm. Ethiopia growth story. We are very excited about Ethiopia. Uh, you've got 90, 92 million people. Again, rapid economic growth, 7 to 8 percent uh, sustained over a number of years. And the dynamic that you see playing out across Africa is particularly pronounced in Ethiopia as it relates to the beverage industry. Uh, the beer market there is growing at double digit rates and our customers, the international uh, beverage companies, the brewers, are struggling to keep pace with the growth and demand. So they keep on reinvesting and reinvesting. And they need your support in country. Exactly, the way that they get their product to market is in a bottle or in a can, which is where we come in. So we have been engaging with our customers with a view to setting up a bottle factory, uh, which would be located obviously in Ethiopia. Uh, the project is in its early stages. We, we have made progress with uh, discussions with a number of partners. We also understand that it is a challenging country to execute projects in. So we are not taking huge risks. We want to do this carefully. We want to do it thoroughly. We want to 
ensure that we can expatriate our profits that we intend to make in that country. And once all of those stars are aligned, we will approach our board with a proposal to proceed. When you say challenges, are we talking about the, the fact that it isn't uh, deregulated and not 100% investor friendly when it comes to foreign direct investment? I think there are a number of uh, unintended regulatory hurdles uh, and that is due to a fairly uh, old and antiquated, dare I say, uh, regulatory system that has not been updated to keep pace with the speed of business as it's done these days. The government's very aware of it and they, and they are putting uh, trying steps hard in to place. make the changes. Absolutely. They are trying hard to be as investor friendly as possible. However, the officials on the ground have to apply the law and the rules as it is at the moment. So they're not in a position to waive just because you happen to have a nice project. How far off do you think that botting plant in Ethiopia is? Is it going to be a reality in the next couple of years? We, we intend to bring a proposal to our board within this calendar year on that project. I'm using you as a barometer for Africa because NAMPAC's footprint is substantial across the African continent. Zimbabwe is yes. another territory that I want to talk about and I want you to give me visibility into what is happening in that territory. Yes. Zimbabwe, ironically, is the country, due to its dollarization, where the weakening rand has been very advantageous to us. And it's, it's at this point in time, one of our more profitable African countries, which is contrary to popular perception. So even while the general economy is struggling and so there are subdued challenges... So consumer... Correct. Again, um, the amazing thing of the market that we serve, which is the beer market, is that it's incredibly uh, resilient. And in fact, uh, people go so far as to say that the beer market is counter-cyclical. So when the going gets tough, the tough go drinking. And that seems to be the approach and it really works out well for us. So Zimbabwe, are you going to invest more than if the environment is conducive? If the environment is conducive, we will consider. Obviously, Zimbabwe will have to compete with other opportunities that we have. We have limited capital resources, limited human resources, and we have to deploy those where they will earn the greatest return for us. I want to use this interview as an introduction to Andre de Reuter to the audience. Tell us a little bit about your day, so we, we get a, some insight into the life that you lead. I'm a morning person, so I rise very, very early. I think NAMPAC, by and large, is a caffeine field, field organization. We operate on huge quantities of this stuff, to be followed by red wine after hours. Um, if I can persuade myself to go to gym, that's what I do. Otherwise, I find myself in the office uh, 20 past 6, 6.30, so pretty early, uh, clear out my inbox, although my secretary will probably say that I don't do enough of that. Um, and then it's, it's meetings. I, I firmly believe in the old farmer saying that the best fertilizer is found on the soles of your boots. So I walk the plants, I visit plants often, um, inspect them, uh, and this is where, again, my SASL experience of operations excellence really, I think, can make a contribution to so what you, I bring to NAMPAC. you're on the factory floor yep. on a regular basis? Yes, yes. Uh, looking at housekeeping, looking at safety. Safety, given my petrochemical background, is very important to me and it's an emphasis that I am bringing to NAMPAC. Um, real strong focus on making sure that we don't injure people. Uh, it's something that I think we have a moral obligation to do. Uh, and fundamentally, we are a manufacturing enterprise. We make money in our plants. We have to have clever accountants, we have to have clever lawyers to look after structuring and optimization opportunities, but fundamentally we have to make bottles and cans and we need to do that as profitably as possible. You mentioned meetings, there's a culture to shorter meetings. Are you, do you err uh, on the side of longer or shorter meetings? I love a short meeting. I love a meeting that's to the point, uh, that involves as little as possible chewing of the fat, uh, somebody needs to make a call. Uh, I think what is very important is obviously to get buy-in. Uh, so I don't have a dictatorial style. Uh, it's not uh, thumping the table and saying this It's a this democracy. Is, this, no, it's not a democracy. It's not a country club. Uh, you know, we are not here to keep people happy. We are here to uh, produce value for the shareholder. But I have to say my management team and I are very aligned 
we have the same objectives, we have the same agenda, and that makes conversations very simple and very straightforward. When you came in, did you relook the executives that uh, surrounded you? Did you yeah. bring in some of your own people? Yes, I think the uh, group executive committee today looks very different to the one that uh, I found when I got here. So a number of people have uh, retired, a number of people have resigned. Um, and I think the people that we have in place now are people that perform, uh, they really deliver value and they're very focused on achieving the joint strategy that we have as a management team. Let's talk a bit about this investor sentiment because it works negatively for a share price obviously, that's what we're referring to here. And you've had quite a tough time. When you came in the share price was heady. Mm -hmm. and then subsequently it fell. How does that feel? Well, I think one, one's got to look at uh, the sustainability of earnings. I think you need to look at the income statement, how much of earnings are attributable to once-off impacts and how much of earnings is due to sustainable performance of the business. And I think the point that NAMPAC had reached was that we needed to deliver on sustainable operating performance. And as an example of that, uh, the glass business uh, had been unprofitable even before my arrival and as, and as a consequence of really fairly poor project execution, um, that was exacerbated. And I think the, the obligation that we have as a management team is to restore confidence that our fundamental ability to operate our assets well, that that has been restored. Did you feel under pressure from the market, from investors? I feel a huge responsibility towards shareholders to deliver value to them. Uh, we take that responsibility very seriously in NAMPAC and, that's, and that really drives our decisions. We, we very often sit around as a management team and say, would this be in best interest of shareholders? And it, and it drives our decisions, so we, we do take it very seriously. What most excites you about the NAMPAC story? You've been fully absorbed in NAMPAC since April 2014. And there must be something that gets you out of work early in the morning. You've mentioned you're here at 6, 6.30. What is that, that driving underpin to the NAMPAC story? There are two things, if I may. The first one is the Africa growth story, which we firmly believe in and we believe that we will be vindicated on that strategy. In, uh, in the next three to five years. So do we, as a channel, by the way, <laughs> as CNBC Africa. Yeah, so, we, so we firmly believe in that. The second thing that excites me is the opportunity that we have to make this car go faster. We've got a fantastic vehicle to deliver good results. We have, I think, the right team driving the car. We have a good team of mechanics that is now harnessing all of those talents and making things mesh, all the cogs mesh, to make this car go faster and faster around the NAMPAC track. What about travel? When we come back to your diary, how do you manage to navigate the African continent, especially, as you say, if you like to kick the tires on a regular yes. basis? Yes. I, I don't travel enough in Africa. I'd like to travel even more in Africa. Um, What's stopping you? Time. Uh, connections are still difficult. Uh, to take a trip into Africa, as you well know, takes a large chunk out of your diary uh, and it does take uh, a lot of time and commitment to get there. Uh, I think as well what, what gives me a lot of comfort is that we've got a great uh, set of management teams in Africa running our operations. These are people that I trust, that I rely on uh, and in fact I think our African operations very often are conducted at higher standards than some of our operations in South Africa. So I think the general, dare I say, arrogance and complacency that we have in South Africa, that we know it all and that we will bring the gospel to the rest of Africa, I think there's, there's, a, there's a bit of modesty that needs to be applied to that. So let's talk about South Africa and the operating environment right now. What is working for you from a macroeconomic perspective and what is not? What is working for us is um, the weak rand. What is also working well for us is that we have now reached, by and large, the end of our recapitalization program. So we've invested over the past uh, three to four years an amount of about 1.6 billion rand in new capital equipment. 
we made that investment at an average exchange rate of around about eight to nine rand to the dollar. You can imagine. Now we're at 16. So that gives us. It makes us, a lot of sense. It makes a lot of sense and uh, it, it gives us a built in competitive advantage. What about the boost from potential exports? Packaging is a difficult commodity to export because uh, essentially what you're doing is you're transporting air around the world. So it's, it's not particularly favorable to us from an export point of view. We do export, particularly into Africa, but it's really only to neighboring countries. Uh, and therefore the RAND doesn't give us a huge boost when it comes to exports. 2015, your year end is in September. You made the statement that you were expecting better results come 2016, just having mapped out the currency impact, the positive currency impact. Do you think that you are going to be able to deliver on that outlook statement that you presented in 2015? I think we're going to see a substantially improved performance from glass. Uh, we are guiding the market, and we have done so publicly on a number of occasions. Uh, that we will see a turnaround in glass of around about 200 million rand, which is very significant in our lives. Uh, we see continued strong performance from the beverage can business, volume growth very good, uh, particularly in South Africa. Uh, our diversified and food can business, strong performance there as well, as a result of turnaround activities that are taking place there. Uh, the plastics business also uh, benefiting from turnaround uh, opportunities. We have launched an initiative to buy better, make better and sell better. So uh, just from a procurement perspective, we anticipate benefits that will flow through of about 200 million rand just by using our buying power uh, better uh, and also the operations excellence and uh, marketing excellence campaign. So there's a, there's a lot that... You're sounding positive. I'm, I'm, I'm positive, I'm bullish that we're doing the right things in order to deliver sustainable profitability. What is challenging for you in South Africa at the moment? What is challenging is the uh, local municipal infrastructure. One of our great frustrations is not so much uh, load shedding as a result of ESCOM. It is rather a poorly maintained municipal infrastructure in certain of the municipalities in which we operate. Frequent power failures due to cable faults or substation failures uh, really is not conducive to running a continuous manufacturing operation. And, and I think in fact, it's, it's a harmful for a factory environment to have sudden stoppages, yes, etc. Yes, so you know the redundancy that you have to employ through installation of generators and so on uh, is really not helpful, also from a cost and a capital perspective. So if there's, if there's one magic wand that I would want to wave across South Africa, it is to improve service delivery at local level. And I think it will also contribute greatly to some of the social tensions that we're seeing in the country at the moment. I want to go back to Africa for a moment and what really interests me is the, the risk appetite that investors have for different African countries. And of course you, you can't paint Africa with one brush. We're talking about 54 different countries with completely different policies in most instances. When you engage with your board, what are the risk assessment tools that you use to decide whether that is a viable investment going forward. And here I'm looking at just those basic elements, policy, stability, safety and security, uh, the regulatory environment. What, what are those flags that would kind of get you to reverse an investment decision, which is difficult to do, yes. considering you go in and you invest and you put bricks and mortar on the ground? Yes, yes. So we will obtain commitments from our customers who are multinational beverage companies before we make an investment, which significantly reduces market entry risk, it reduces volume risk, and it also reduces payment risk. One of the typical risks that people speak about when they talk about investing in Africa is that, will I get paid? Well, we get paid because we have... Because you're following chip. your client base, your multinational exactly. client base into these territories. Exactly. Now that doesn't guarantee that they will sell beer and carbonated soft drinks. So there is a market risk that we have to face and that we share with them. Um, but that is a risk that, that given our relationship that we have, we discuss openly, we discuss often with them, and we have a really exceptional customer base with whom we have 
great relationship. So from that perspective, from a market risk point of view, there's, there's a lot of information on the table and a lot of risk mitigation. Currency is a major issue in our lives. Uh, liquidity, as well as the ability to freely repatriate earnings in country. And therefore we do quite a bit of work with various banks to establish the channels, understand how they function, but also to look at some of the precedents on uh, how that has worked for other investors. Final question. In the current landscape, when you operate in so many different countries as we've already spoken about, including South Africa, is there something that keeps you awake at night? Sentiment. Uh, I think the, the huge risk aversion towards Africa from the broader investment community is overdone at this point in time. It obviously has a bearing on how we are perceived by the market and uh, there are potential consequences to that. And I would uh, really like people, to the extent that I'm able to influence them, to take a somewhat medium-term view and look at the next three to five years rather than look at the next two months. Andre, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. I've been chatting to Andre de Reuter, the CEO of NAMPAC. You're watching Captains of Industry here on CNBC Africa, DSTV 410.